um, just addressing an issue that I thought would, would, would be a good thing to address. And um, uh, so I, I don't know whether it suits the Wangarei congregation. I, I think most likely it would. I think most likely it would suit most congregations. Starts off with a little, a little something that I learned uh, when I was young. One, two, three, the devil's after me. Four, five, six, he's always up to tricks. Seven, eight, nine, he misses every time. Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. I imagine I learned that at, at Sabbath school or something like that when I was very young. Normally I like to take a service. I love to take sermons on God's grace and his love and forgiveness. But sometimes it's useful for us to take a look at the opposition, uh, to look at the ways that he tries to trip us up, because like the saying goes, it's good to be, uh, for, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Two texts come to mind when I, um, when I was thinking of this. The first one is found in uh, 1, Peter, uh, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, is walking around seeking whom he may devour. That's true, isn't it? Satan has not taken, is, is not on holiday. He hasn't taken it easy in these last few years because he's getting old. He is even more so now, like a roaring lion, seeking out you and seeking out me in the effort to devour our souls. Another text that comes to mind is um, Ephesians 4, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So if you think that you are physically strong or mentally smart, and you're going to go up against Satan you've lost before you've even started. We're not fighting against somebody else our equal. We're fighting against a supernatural being. It might be of interest uh, to you what I do in fielding. I'm what they call the Bible worker uh, in fielding and I work uh, one or two days a week uh, just looking for Bible studies and studying with people who are not, who are not Adventist people. And we just started doing that this year as part of our outreach program and just trying to do something a little different. And I, I think you have something different here with Gary. He, as a lay person, works uh, one day a week. And um, uh, this is just my first year doing it, and um, we'll see how successful it is. I have a number of Bible studies now and, uh, and people that, that I'm working with. And all of last year, uh, knowing, or particularly at the end of last year, knowing that we were going to do this thing, what we wanted to do was to create a nurturing church where if new people did come in, uh, they would find a safe place to come to, a place that they'd want to return to. And uh, so we've concentrated on that and uh, we've had special prayer meetings and, and, and I feel the congregation has really taken it on board and uh, come down to our fielding church sometimes and, and see if you can feel the Spirit of God there. I believe you can. And I made a prediction at the beginning of this year that... Um, once the church moved into, into saving mode, once it moved into, into an outreach program where the Spirit of God was working, that roaring lion would start to work. We would see all sorts of things start to happen. Now, I was at another church uh, just uh, two or three weeks ago. And a very capable lady was taking the Sabbath school lesson. And uh, she had become a Seventh-day Adventist Christian uh, in her adult life, obviously by what she was saying. But she said she can remember before she became a Christian, before she became a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, her, her brother became a Christian, became converted, he and his wife. And she said she just stood back and watched them. And she, she, she said she couldn't believe what happened for the, for the next 12 months. Everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong in her brother's life. And at the end of the 12 months, her brother sat back and looked at what had happened to his life in the last 12 months, and he said... Everything that could have gone wrong has gone wrong in my life since I became a Christian. I don't want to be a Christian anymore. It's too hard. And he gave up being a Christian. Uh, his wife continued to be a Christian. Their marriage broke up. 
and eventually her brother died of cancer, never giving his heart back to the Lord. <clears throat> you see, once we become a Christian, once we give our hearts to the Lord, once we want to become his disciple and his helper, then that's when Satan gets active and he will put all sorts of things in your way. Let me give you some examples of what's happened in our church this year. Since we, I believe, have begun a, a work of, um, of reaching out and, and uh, the spirit in a greater measure has been fielding. <clears throat> a number of years ago, about six years ago, I was involved with Kids Club and a lovely little girl came along there and, um, and I, I baptised her. She was only ten. And um, she met up with a, uh, one of our young men. She's um, now a young lady, very attractive young lady. And it was devastating to me to find out this year that she got pregnant. You know, and I went round to visit her and um, I, I know them well. I've, I've, I've spent hours with their family and um, she had brought her brother and, and family along to church as well. And uh, she's not a bad girl. You know, she's, it was a mistake that she made. And I sat down and had a chat with her and her mum and um, said, look, you know, what's happened here is not good. You know, what, what, what's happened? And, of course, I didn't really need to tell her that. She knew that wasn't good. And I said, you hold position in the church. You can't hold that for the rest of this year because of what you've done. And, you know, she was a junior deaconess, and I said, that's an important position. And, and she began to cry, and uh, her mum began to cry. And it was really very sad, you know, and I felt bad about it, you know, but... <clears throat> that really, that wasn't a good thing. And by the way, I went to see the, uh, the male partner as well and told him the same thing. And, uh, but that was, you see, that, that, could, that was Satan at work. It could have become a big problem where we made a big thing about it. And I said, now, please don't stop coming to church. You know, she said, oh, I feel so embarrassed now. People will be talking about me and this, that and the other thing will happen. I said, look, I'm sure people will still welcome you into church. What you've done is not a good thing. But don't stop coming to church. And she did stop for three or four weeks, but people worked with her and said, look, we'd love to see her. And, uh, and she's back again now with a big tummy. But people love her just the same. And I say this, that it doesn't matter so much what happens because our church largely is a reflection of the society that, uh, uh, that we are part of. But it doesn't matter so much what happens. I mean, it does matter to some extent. It doesn't matter so much what happens. It's our response to what happens that counts. Let me give you another example. I'm giving you examples from Fielding, and I sort of feel a little bit free to do that because you don't know who I'm talking about. At least most of you won't. <clears throat> but an incident happened uh, in our church a few weeks back um, where a young person, uh, just a teenager, turned up at church, never been there before and to come with one of, one of his friends. And he did something silly during church service time. And uh, what he did offended one of the young mothers there, and she was really put out by it. And, uh, and it was a situation that you could see Satan just keeping on the boil and really seeing what he could make out of this, you know. And uh, one of our grandmothers went up to this young boy and said, what you did was a silly thing. It was a bad thing, you know. You need to go and apologise to the lady that you have offended. And to his credit, he did. He went and apologised to that lady. And to the lady's credit, she accepted his apology and said, that's fine, I don't want, I'm finished with it. That's it. You know, it's all forgiven and forgotten. Other stuff that have happened this year, for instance, uh, a man, Ron Brooking, uh, the face of Fielding, really. I mean, if you ever visited Fielding, he'd be the man that'd be greeting you on the door. He's one of the, each, each church usually has one of these people. He's one of these, one of these old retired gentlemen that looks after everything in the church, just quietly does stuff during the week and fixes it up. He used to come out and help my dad on the farm every day, except Sabbath. And uh, one day he and Dad, a couple of 80-year-olds, you know, they used to mess around doing things, fixing up gates and fences and things. 
Dad's foot slipped off the accelerator, off the brake, and, uh, and ran him over. And, and he died a week later in hospital just this week. And not this week, just this year. And I could go on and, and, and tell you other little things, and I can see things seem like a whole lot of stuff's happened this year that Satan is really getting at us and trying to make us uh, turn against each other, to fight each other, to lose the Spirit of God, to somehow become discouraged. But we have a helper far greater than Satan. We have Jesus Christ, God, who's far more superior, who has far more power than anything that Satan can throw at us. You know, there are other issues that might, that might come into your church, and you can think, I don't know what's happening in your church, but you can think of all those, some people perhaps having health problems, finance problems, unemployment problems. And so on the list will go that the Satan will use to distract you or to put you off or to discourage you from following the Lord and doing what he wants you to do. I heard a story years ago. It's not a true story, and you'll know that from my first sentence. The devil decided he was going to retire, probably by a little batch down by the lake of fire somewhere. And... Um, <clears throat> Uh, he decided he'd, he'd had enough of, of tempting and people and causing mischief and uh, he was going to sell all of his tools. And uh, so he, he, he got a big, uh, a big room where he could lay them all out on tables for everyone to have a look, all the other demons that might want to continue on in the work and buy these well-used but very successful tools. And uh, they were laid out on the table and each one was labelled and what they'd been used for and some of them had... Uh, Famous people that had been uh, that had been conquered by the use of these tools. There were the ordinary tools like dishonesty, lying, immorality, sort of straightforward tools that were still pretty successful. But there were other tools there that were more special. There was a uh, sort of a multi-pronged tool there, like a bit like a Swiss Army knife. You know, uh, it 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 really had a prominent position. It was like an antique. It was the very first tool that he had used. He used it on Eve. Uh, it was a tool of of telling a lie, uh, of appealing to her appetite. Come and eat this apple. It looks really nice, or fruit, whatever it might have been. And uh, by the way, when you eat it, uh, you'll become like God. He appealed to her pride, a sort of a multi-pronged tool. And um, and that was in a in a special special position there. Uh, there were various other tools that he that he had used. Um, uh, very successfully over the years and eventually the day of the auction came and um, all the demons were there purchasing uh, these tools that Satan had used. They all went for a good price and finally he got to the, to the one that he had a very high reserve on, the one that he favoured the most. The bidding was brisk and the price went high but eventually everybody was played out and it couldn't reach the reserve. That Satan had and Satan said this is such a special tool I cannot let it go so cheaply it was a tool of discouragement and so Satan kept that tool for himself he never retired and he continues to use it today the tool of discouragement how many people do you know over the years and it amazes me where a person can be a Christian for many years 20 30 years something said or done something happens and they give it all away. I used to love to go and watch our local basketball team um, down there in Palmerston North, the Jets. And um, I haven't been to watch them for a while because this is the first year they've played decently for a long time and I haven't got back into watching them again. But for the first part, last time I went to see them, the first part of the season they played really well. And then at the end of the season they were losing to teams that were at the bottom of the ladder and and uh, it wasn't so good to watch them. They would play a good game for three quarters of the game, a good game for half the game, a good first and last quarter. But unless you play a game good right to the end, it's not a good game, is it? If you win to the third quarter and lose in the last quarter, it's not a win. And it's the same with us, for those of us who are bound for the kingdom of God. It's only for those who persevere to the end. I'm going to ask um, if we could have some pictures up on the screen there. 
Um, and uh, they'll be there in just a moment. There it is there. In 2005, uh, I went over to England to stay uh, to see our son over there, a Brook, who was uh, doing his two-year OE, as a lot of kids do over in England. And so I just went over there to see him for, for 10 days. And we went very quickly. Now, I know a lot of you here will have been to England, and uh, you know that uh, there's, there's so much to see that you can't see nearly all that much in 10 days. But we scratched the surface and and got a pretty good idea of what the place was like. And um, we went down to South England and um, up through Wales and to the Lake District and uh, then North England and into Scotland for four days and then came home again. And uh, this is in South Wales. It's called the Carfilly Castle. It's um, the second largest castle in England next to Windsor Castle where the Queen lives. Now that's an area size, 30 acres. The castle itself, the living quarters, are not particularly grand or not even particularly large. The 30 acres includes uh, what was a renovation and fortifications in those days. This was built in 1268 during the medi medieval period. And um, the man that built it, his name was Gilbert the Red. Red because he was a redhead. And um, Gilbert the Red, uh, he was from the de Clare family. They were Norman of descent or French. And uh, at the time, there was a, the Prince of Wales was a man by the name of Llewellyn the Last. Obviously, because he was the last of the Llewellyn dynasty. And he was being quite aggressive in Wales at that time. And he was moving down Wales, down to, to South Wales there, uh, taking, taking all the land in his way. And uh, Gilbert the Red did not want his, uh, he was a noble, he didn't want his land and his wealth and his people overrun by Llewellyn, and so he thought, I'll build a big castle and uh, protect myself. And he built that in four years. Absolutely amazing. All those lakes are man-made, and um, uh, tremendous defences. You see, normally you see a castle and it has a moat around it. Well, he had a good idea, I'll make a castle with water around it, I'll then put another wall and I'll put water around it again. And the machinery they used to use those days to conquer castles were these big catapults and other things they used to use. And these big catapults could throw big stones like this about 40 yards. And so Gilbert very cleverly designed this so that the, the catapults couldn't get close enough to throw stones at his walls and break them down. And so you've got these huge lakes round about the castle. A few years after it was built, uh, not all that long after it was built, a, an invader did come and try and conquer the castle and couldn't. He couldn't get in. It was conquered a couple of times in 1304. Can we have some more pictures there just to give you an idea of it? That's one of the walls that Oliver Cromwell's blamed for doing that. Uh, it's got a three metre lean on it. Uh, he decided he wanted to wreck a few of the fortifications in Wales and came over and did some damage, but it's still standing. Next picture there if we can, that's just another side of it. A uh, bit of a moat and earthworks around there. Next picture. It's another side of it. Um, and the next picture. That one's a bit dark. Uh, one after that. It's just another side of it there. And one more. There's one more, I think. Thank you. But there's, there's Brook there. We're standing around uh, what I think is... I showed you that was that... Um, People go to to great extent to protect themselves physically, don't they? This uh, Gilbert the Red went to a tremendous effort to build that castle, to dig those lakes, to dam them up and, and to, to build all the fortifications so that he could be protected against the invader. I couldn't help but think of the spiritual implication we also need to protect ourselves against the invader, which would be Satan. I haven't been to Switzerland, but I've talked to people who have been there and who have lived there, people who have come from there. And if you lived in Switzerland and you're a male of, of a certain age, you have to do military training. Now, that, that you might think that's strange. Switzerland hasn't been to war for 150 years, maybe even longer than that. Why are they so worried about defence? The reason that they're so worried about defence and spend so much money on defence is so that they never will be attacked. Every young man that goes into the army at the end of that time is issued with a government rifle, five rounds of ammunition, and he keeps that for the length of his adult life. 
inspectors come round and inspect the rifle now and again and make sure it's in good walking, uh, working order and that you still have the five rounds of ammunition. The borders of Switzerland can be cut down in minutes. Tank traps come up and uh, arms go up and they can secure their country just in a few minutes and yet they never go to war. I wanted to uh, switch back to a story <coughs> in the Bible. It's a story that you will know well. It's a story of a person who could have become discouraged but never, if he did not for long. It's a story of Joseph. The story of Joseph is a fascinating story because Joseph is a type of Christ. He's a saviour. Uh, he was a saviour in a literal sense. He saved the people of Egypt and God's people. That was the children of Israel. And if you go through the life of Joseph, he started in a favoured position, the favoured son of Jacob. He went down to the lowest position that a man can be, that is a slave. He went down to Egypt and there he was restored again by doing good work for other people, in this case Potiphar. And the very people that he did good for, that is the Potiphar's household, or in this case his wife, told lies about him and he was cast in prison. However, from prison he was restored to the right hand of Pharaoh. Now you parallel that with the life of Jesus. He came down from heaven, a grand and great position, God himself, and he came down as one of his created beings, but not just one of his created beings, he came down into a humble peasant home where his parentage was questioned. Spent an obscure life for 30 years and then spent the next three years trying to help people. And then after those three years, the very people that he tried to help sold him for 30 pieces of silver, like Joseph who sold for 20, nailed him to a cross, and they thought they had killed him. But after three days, he arose again and ascended to the right hand of his father. I want to take you back just to, to the beginning of the story, and I'm just going to take three incidents out of, the, out of the life of Joseph. The first one is when he was uh, taken as a slave by his brothers. Jacob did a foolish thing by showing favouritism to the son. The other ten boys hated him because of it, and to make matters word worse, he made this lovely coat for him, and every day that Joseph wore it, it reminded the other brothers of the favouritism and their hatred towards him. And so came the day where Jacob sent Joseph out and said, uh, your brothers have got the the flocks over there at Shechem, I want you to go over there and, and take some food for them, see how they're going and bring a report back to me. Joseph went to Shechem, about 17 years old at this time, and uh, they weren't there. But the local people said yeah, they were here, but uh, they've moved their flocks on to Dotham. And uh, that was another 13 miles. He walked over 20 miles that day to find his brothers. And as he approached them, uh, his brothers could see him, and the reason they could see him was because of the bright coloured coat that he was wearing and they began talking to themselves here comes that dreamer here comes that one that we hate so much and their hatred was so intense they said let's kill him it seems like Joseph didn't realise the hatred his brothers had for him and sure enough as soon as he arrived they grabbed him roughly they tore that hated coat off him and they chucked him in a dry well not long till the uh, Ishmaelites came along, traders on their way to Egypt, and um, the, oldest, uh, the oldest son, Reuben, was not there for some reason. He had gone away someplace. And they sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the distant relatives, the Ishmaelites. And Joseph went on down to Egypt. Was this a point of time where he could have been discouraged? From the favoured son that he had been that morning before he left home, from the favoured son who was wearing the robes of royalty to suddenly be stripped and treated roughly by the brothers that were his own blood. And now he was on the way to Egypt. He did not know what was in front of him, but he knew he had no control over whatever was going to come. I like the way Alan White pens it in Prophet, Patriarchs and Prophets. I'll just take the time to read you uh, two paragraphs here. Meanwhile, Joseph with his captors was on the way to Egypt. 
As the caravan journeyed southward toward the borders of Canaan, the boy could discern in the distance the hills among which lay his father's tents. Bitterly he wept at, at the thought of that loving father in his loneliness and affliction. Again the scene at Dotham came up before him. He saw his angry brothers and felt their fierce glances bent upon him. The stinging, insulting words that had met his agonised entreaties were ringing in his ears. With a trembling heart he looked forward to the future. What a change in situation, from the tenderly cherished son to the despised and helpless slave. Alone and friendless, what would be his lot in the strange land to which he was going? For a time Joseph gave himself up to uncontrolled grief and terror. Then his thoughts turned to his father's God. In his childhood he had been taught to love and fear him. Often in his father's tent he had listened to the story of the vision that Jacob saw as he fled from his home and exile and a fugitive. He had been told of the Lord's promises to Jacob and how they had been fulfilled. How in the hour of need the angel of God had come to instruct, comfort and protect him. And he had learned of the love of God in providing for men a redeemer. Now all these precious lessons came vividly before him. Joseph believed that the God of his fathers would be his God. He then and there gave himself fully to the Lord, and he prayed that the keeper of Israel would be with him in the land of his exile. His soul thrilled with the high resolve to prove himself true to God, under all circumstances to act as became a subject of the King of Heaven. He would serve the Lord with undivided heart. He would meet the trials of his lot with fortitude and perform every duty with fidelity. One day's experience had been the turning point in Joseph's life. Its terrible calamity had transformed him from a petted child to a man, thoughtful, courageous, and self-possessed. You see, Satan thought that he had dealt a fatal blow to Joseph. Just going back to one of the incidents I talked before about the death of our, uh, our very esteemed and, and loved member, Ron. Do you think that took God by surprise? Did his death surprise God? I wasn't expecting that. God knew that was going to happen. God made provision for it. We have another retired gentleman that very capably took his place. We had another lady that had just recently arrived. She's now the greeter on the door. God's never taken by surprise. God wasn't taken by surprise here with Joseph. Satan thought that he had enacted a coup. Satan turned it, Jesus, God turned it round and Satan fell flat on his face. And so even in this traumatic time as uh, Joseph, and we, I remember seeing pictures of Joseph in Uncle Arthur's bedtime story, riding on a camel, looking back towards the hills where his father was. I don't imagine he rode on a camel. I imagine he had to walk. And uh, he was probably tied up, tied behind a camel. But as he walked those weary miles down to Egypt, as uh, Alan White has just explained, not knowing what the future was, there and then he decided whatever that might be, I will not be discouraged. I will follow God right through to the end. Jump forward 10 years. Joseph is now in Potiphar's house. He's now in charge of everything. He's, he followed through his commitment to be the best that he could. The Bible tells us that Joseph was a good-looking, handsome man. He was strong and well-built and muscular. At the peak of his manhood, 27 years old, noticed by Potiphar's wife, and continually she said rude and suggestive things to him, trying to encourage him into an area that he did not want to go to. And finally, out of desperation, you know the story, and I'll keep it family good here today, you know the story where she tried to entice him, cleared the house, and Joseph would not be enticed. Was that something that Joseph had to think about? Was Potiphar's wife attractive? I'm certain she would have been attractive. Was that an attractive sin to him? I'm sure it was. But not as attractive as it was to doing what God wanted him to do. That decision that day that he had to make with Potiphar's wife wasn't a decision he made that day. He made that decision a long time ago. And so it was an easy thing for him to walk out of that room and say to the woman, how can I do this great wickedness and sin not so much against you and your husband 
how can I do this great wickedness against God? Potiphar came home. She told him the fabricated story, a lie. I like to read between the lines here. Potiphar didn't believe his wife, you know. But to save face, he had to put Joseph in jail. The Bible tells us that Potiphar was furious. At least he made out he was furious. If he really believed his wife, he would have killed him. He was only a slave. It wouldn't have mattered. Instead, he sent Joseph to jail. At this point, Joseph could have been really discouraged. Lord, I know what happened when I was 17. I was young. I was, pr I was, uh, I I was a prideful person. I had a lot to learn. And I've followed your ways ever since that, these last 10 years. And look where it's got me. In prison. I'm a nobody again. In a land that, I, that is not even my own. Amongst people that are not even of my custom. But Joseph stuck with that decision that he had made 10 years previous. I will be the best that I can be, Lord. I have no idea why I'm here. I do not deserve this. But I will be the best that I can be. I will serve you. Shortly after he came there, the three men arrived and he interpreted the dream, two men, and he interpreted the dream for them. One got killed.